Namaste. So here we are again, up on the roof. <laughs> Only a few more days before I have to leave for Sri Lanka. So I'm trying to make the most of it. Beautiful view of the mountains today. Anyway, these last two chapters, chapters five and six of the Shristi Kanda, are about the creation, the very beginning of the creation. And in chapter five, which you should watch, Narada is going on pilgrimage and he meets with the two ganas, the attendants of Shiva that he cursed at the Svayamvara. And he elaborates more on the nature of the curse that they're going to be born as demons and become rulers of the whole universe. But they'll be following the principles of the Vedas and acting as Shiva's devotees. So this is very nice and they're happy and they go home. Then he continues and he winds up at Kashi. This is the first mention of Kashi. But uh, Kashi is a very important holy center. Kashi nowadays known as Benares or Varanasi. And uh, it's in central part of India, central north India. And uh, there's probably more Shiva temples per square inch <laughs> than any other place on earth. And uh, it's a very powerful holy place. Many people go there to leave their bodies at the end of their lives. Um, so in this place, he, he finally attains satisfaction and peace. And so then, as he was instructed by Vishnu in the last chapter, chapter 4, he goes to Brahma, his father, and he inquires from him. And this list of questions that Narada asks Brahma are very important. They make really good topics for meditation or research or contemplation. In other words, the, the crux of the matter is, why is there a creation? And how is it? How does nothing become something? Because at the end of the devastation, the Mahapralaya, at the end of the universe, is nothing. Not even a supreme being. It's just blank nothingness. And only Brahman exists at that time. And Brahman isn't related to anything. Brahman is not a doer. Brahman is pure being, one without a second. So at some point, Brahman, it said, desires. Huh? But how can Brahman desire? If, Brahman, uh, if Brahman's desires are always fulfilled, how can Brahman desire anything? And then this becomes the point. Yes, confirmed. This becomes the point that the whole creation is done by means of maya, prakriti, nature, which infers duality. But there is no duality in Brahman, and Brahman is only that which really exists. Everything else is an illusion. Why is it an illusion? Because it changes, it comes and goes. It transforms from one thing into another. So because of this temporary nature of the creation, the whole thing is considered maya. Now, does that mean that we don't need to worship God and that we don't have to perform any material activities and that if we're really self-realized, we'll just sort of merge into Brahman or nothingness? No. No. And the reason for that is we are not on that platform. 
We are not on the platform of highest consciousness, Turiya or Turiya Tita. We are down amongst the modes of material nature, in a body, in a world, which is controlled by God and gods, huh? demigods. Ishwara is the supreme controller, and all the other demigods are subsidiary controllers of various aspects of material nature, and we have to deal with them. Otherwise, there are so many obstacles to our spiritual progress that we could never attain full enlightenment. See, this is where the uh, Neo-Edwaitans go wrong. They think, oh, everything is one. There's only Brahman that really exists. Everything else is illusion, so we can do whatever we want. No, <laughs> no. Because the modes of material nature are in operation in the material world. And if you perform activities that are in the mode of passion and ignorance, you get bad karma as a result. I mean, the very least that can happen is that you have to take another material birth. So the only way to be comfortable and successful in the material world and attain ultimate self-realization is to perform activities in the mode of goodness, sattva guna. That means worship of God, sacrifice, charity, study of the Vedas, and so on. Sadhana, chanting of mantras, meditation, uh, control of the senses. All these things are necessary because we live in the world. Let's get our feet on the ground here. Huh? Just like, you know, now at the end of October, it's harvest time and all the ganja plants are being harvested and, and rolled up and packaged for distribution and like that. And so what? <laughs> Do you want an illusion? Do you want a dream? You want something false? Huh? Then take drugs. And you're sure to be bewildered and illusioned and fall into delusion and insanity. But if you want to wake up, if you want to know the reality, then you don't take drugs. You don't drink liquor. You don't have uh, illicit sexual affairs and so on. Now, of course, if you're practicing Tantra and you know how to work with these things, they can be used as sadhana. But that's only for people who are very knowledgeable and fortunate and have proper guidance. Let's face it, most of us don't. So what we have to do to make tangible spiritual advancement, to reach actual spiritual satisfaction is to follow the sattva guna, follow the Vedic path. Don't deviate. Uh, don't compromise. If you're going to become a devotee, best thing is to become a devotee of Shiva because Shiva can give all benedictions up to and including final emancipation, moksha, deliverance from material existence. He says in this uh, speech, or the, the answers that Brahma gives to Narada's questions, that they reserve the right of giving moksha for themselves. And they really delegate the process of creation, maintenance, and destruction to others their subsidiary gods. And this is how it should be. Huh? Not that Shiva has to personally <laughs> oversee every little thing, you know. But he does take a direct personal interest in his devotees. And this is a fact, and I've experienced this, that he doesn't like to see his devotees suffer. He can't tolerate it. 
he has to intervene, even though it's really, you know, he could certainly uh, delegate that to others too, but he doesn't. You know, or maybe sometimes he does, you know, like sometimes he'll say to one of his devotees, here, go to this planet and, and do this thing and help the people there and whatever. Uh, or like in the case of Narada, he'll use his maya to have a powerful personality act on his behalf to set up some leela in the future that he wants to perform. But when he gets involved directly, it's always to deliver mercy to his devotees. And this is his purpose. He's very, very concerned about his devotees because he wants to bring them to the point where they can actually merge with him and become part of him. And this is really the uh, final conclusion of all sadhana, of all Vedic study, of all the karma and the work that we do and the things that happen and how we deal with them. And so, you know, the whole story of life and existence is that finally we come to merge with Shiva. Sayuja Mukti. And people are like really scared of, of Sayuja Mukti. You talk to the Vaishnavas, they're terrified of it. They don't want to be, even hear the word Aum. <laughs> you know, they're like, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. But their belief is that the individuality is eternal. That we were individuals in the past from beginningless time and that we will remain individuals forever in the future. But the problem with being an individual is that there's suffering. There's always suffering. And you can read even in the Shastra, for example, in the 10th canto of Srimad Bhagavatam, how Krishna's devotees are suffering. So, you know, it's like, I don't get it. After a while, it's like, why should we go on with this suffering when liberation is available? Why don't we pursue moksha and mukti instead? I guess it's a matter of personal taste. But to me, it doesn't make sense to try to cling to being a separate individual person when the result of that is only going to be suffering, even in the spiritual realm. I would rather become a part of Shiva and there is no more suffering. Huh? Because Shiva is always bliss. He's in bliss. He is bliss. He lives in bliss. He's surrounded by bliss. His whole existence is nothing but bliss. And this is the way it should be. This is God. Huh? Not some constipated, angry old man up in the clouds getting ready to send everybody to hell forever. That's nonsense. That's not God. God is supreme, peaceful, blissful, all-knowing, all-cognizant, and all-powerful. So in that case, you might ask, well, why does he create the world? And the answer is, it's his sport. It's his pastime. It's his leela. Leela means pleasurable activities. Huh? He's just having fun. He likes drama. Sometimes, look at what he did to Narada in, in the last two chapters. Huh? He made Narada a fool. Huh? You, you can imagine him sitting up there and laughing at him. You know, look at this guy. He sits in my meditation place and then thinks that he's the doer and he's conquered Kama. And then he immediately falls down into lust for some princess, you know. <laughs> it's ridiculous, isn't it? And then he gets angry when he doesn't get her and starts cursing everybody. <laughs> so in this way, Shiva is having a lot of fun at our expense. 
And the only way that we uh, can escape becoming the butt of Shiva's joking is to gain perfect knowledge. He has great respect for those who understand him. I mean, just imagine any powerful person is going to be lonely at the top. You know, I remember when I was a, a guru and had an ashram full of so-called disciples, it was very lonely because I was supposed to be the guy that knows everything and controls everything and tells everybody what to do and all this. And, and they were like children. They were coming to me, you know, what should I do today? <laughs> I'm like, you can't figure that out for yourself? You know, what, what, what about if you weren't here and you didn't have somebody to go to? What would you do? How would you think of, of what to do today? Anyway, they didn't get it. But you can get it. If you follow these series, and, and really, I'm looking at the stats again. You should go through the chapters, hear the chapters, read the chapters. There's links in the description of every video to download the original Shiva Purana, and you can read it. Or you can read it online. There's a link for that, too. But don't skip over the chapters and just listen to me ranting <laughs> about the spiritual insights, uh, because you're going to miss a lot. You're going to miss the details. And really, the essence is in the details. The essence is in the specific questions that Narada asks, and also the narrations that Brahma gives in reply. So you should go through them for your benefit. You know, it's, I'm not, I've already done that work. I've already got the, the benefit, the blessing from that. And my intent in making these videos is to pass that benefit on to you. So, but you have to do the work. Nobody can do it for you. It's not that by listening to this video, you're going to get some special zap or something. <laughs> No, this video is to convince you that you need to go back and go through the thing yourself and think it over and meditate on it and get the benefit of the insight. So do that. Do yourself a favor and go to the original materials. If anybody asks me, well, how did you learn so much and how did you realize so much? I always say, I went to the original scriptures. I went to the source. I didn't take anybody else's interpretation. And I certainly didn't join any organization where I'm just expected to believe something because that's the teaching, dogma, doctrine, or whatever it is. No, I went to the original materials. I worked through it. I did the sadhana. I did the contemplation. And I came to my own conclusions. And that's what worked. So... This is really the secret key to complete self-realization. Aung Tat Sat. Aung Shakti Aung. Aung Namah Shivaya. And Happy Diwali too.